Hellstrand och nu mina damer och herrar, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Bowie. And welcome on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very I much. hope we will still have time to talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so surely. This is actually your last stop on a it quite is. an extensive tour. You're going back to London. I'm going to eat. Is the next thing I'm going to do. I'm starving. <laughs> okay, I'm so okay. hungry. I'm going to get rained here tonight. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, I, can tell I had you. to order it in advance. Oh, are you yeah. a fan of good cooking? Yeah, yeah. I like uh, Scandinavian cooking a lot. I like the, a lot of the pickled dishes mm -hmm. very much. And uh, you're very partial to game up here, you know. That's Which right. Like pheasant and we have a lot of game in the woods, it's you know, terrific. in the forests. I'm really, I'm quite a meat eater. So, did you have a good time on the tour? Um, you know, it's uh, it's peculiar. Uh, doing promotional work, because that, that's basically what we're doing for yeah. the album hours. Um, we've only kind of been able to do one show a week, approximately. Um, as much as I want to take time off and write and do the other things that I like doing, I want to get some painting done, some sculpting, um, it's kind of frustrating that it's, it's been going so well. The shows have been so fabulous. I kind of regret that we only so did it. you feel know, like playing feel, more? Yeah, yeah. Mm, doing yeah, more live yeah. gigs. I think, well... It, it shouldn't be long. No. I don't know. I just got to get this writing done, you know? I haven't written to my aunt in months. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what no, I mean, other so kind of writing. What, what will she say when you finally well, write, I'm to write to her a book and then see what she thinks of it? <laughs> okay. Uh, will it be an autobiography? No. No. No, no. I've not got time for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> will uh, we ever see an autobiography from you? Not from me. No. No. A lot of books unlikely. have been written about you. 63. Enough, yeah. Any good ones? 63 Any books. good ones? I'm sure there's some good ones there. <laughs> Ever read one? <laughs> yeah, I've read a lot of them. Yeah. 40. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, I think that uh, I want to stay in the world of uh, fiction. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, certain ideas I want to get down. Um, yeah. Also, I'm writing a, a couple of musical ideas. Okay. Theatrical. But that's what you've done through the years. You've uh, created characters, faces, different shapes and figures. Well, yeah. So, so what do you see when you look upon yourself? Uh, I, I mean, I personally think that the characterization stage was mm -hmm. much earlier. I think the uh, majority of the 70s was about mm -hmm. characterization. It, and I guess I've got that luggage that will always travel with me. But uh, to be quite honest, since the 80s, I've virtually done everything as much as I can do as, uh, as for myself. Yeah, yeah. It, it's. But um, you kind of drag that with you. Everybody's always going to refer back to Ziggy Stardust or Thin White Duke or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. different characters they prefer. How do you feel about those characters? Today? Uh, well, I, they were useful devices for me because I wasn't very keen on being a performer, I wasn't terribly comfortable as a performer. And they allowed me, that artifice allowed me somewhere to go. It, it located me in a place that I felt comfortable, which is behind a, a, another mm -hmm. character. But I gradually Sort of got, a shelter from... Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, my original intention was to write songs for other people. When I was a teenager, what I really mm -hmm. wanted to do was kind of write musical-type things and, and songs for other people. And because uh, nobody was doing the songs. So I had to do them myself, and, and, yeah, you know, okay. so it was a dirty job, but uh, somebody <laughs> had to do you it. You had to do it, yeah. okay. So it would seem that some of, some of your characterizations were very carefully planned, were they, actually? Or did, did they just pop well, up? Well, the early ones? Yeah. Uh, I think the, 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 the more successful ones really developed very quickly, and the Ziggy Stardust thing really came within a, a very short period of time. Mm. Uh, I enjoy the process. I like creating... Uh, a landscape and, and, and then putting people in it, mm -hmm. you know, it is good fun. When you return back to, to London to write the letter to your aunt and, and yeah. stuff like that, yeah. <laughs> how do you like to lead a normal life? I mean, what's, what's your everyday life like? Like yours, probably, you know. Oh. It's, it's, it's well, do you know about my life? <laughs> well, no, maybe you, you may have the extreme life of the oh, two of us, you know. Maybe, I, you know so. I'm an old married man, you know. So, you know, you like to paint, you like to sculpture, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the way I, I still to spend it. a lot of time. Well, when I'm not on stage, I still spend an awful lot of time working. It's, mm -hmm. it, for me, it doesn't feel like work. It feels like the engine that drives me. I'm uh, continually writing music or, 
or these days a lot of prose. I do I do some journalistic work these days. I do okay. a lot of interviews for a, a magazine that I, I have in Britain, which yes, is I've heard a, about an arts that. magazine. Mm -hmm. I enjoy that work very much. Mm -hmm. It's a, a good chance to talk with people that I admire and find out how, what the process is that they uh, utilize to get what it is that they do, and I, I find that very stimulating. Do you uh, still find time for friends and family oh, and Lord, stuff yeah. like that? More so than I ever have done. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm quite disciplined about keeping uh, relationships uh, steady and uh, really I'm quite good at keeping in touch with people these days. Yeah. Not when I was young, but much better now. A lot of people would imagine, imagine that you only have friends among <clears throat> other stars and legends of the world. It's but not like that at no. all, you know. I know, uh, ironically, I know very, very few uh, of my contemporaries and mm -hmm. musicians very well. I've met nearly everybody, but I don't know them. My friends tend to be other writers, I mean, uh, prose writers, uh, painters, uh, some musicians, but generally the musicians that I work with, mm -hmm. not so much, you know, people in other bands and whatever. Um, I'm not particularly drawn to that kind of industry thing at all. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I like to be in parts of the world I like living in. Uh, 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 for me, uh, places like downtown New York, Soho, and mm -hmm. that kind of area. Uh, fairly bohemian, you've I guess. A, yeah, but you've got yeah. a few homes. Does anything feel I don't. Like, I have uh, one house. You have one house. Yeah, that's and it. That's your home. Okay, so you don't travel around a lot. You know, I travel you? around a lot, yeah. You do? Yeah. So where do we you go like to? We go to Indonesia, go? I guess, is mm -hmm. where we kind of make a beeline for. I still find it... Um, one of the great curiosities in the world. I don't understand it, and that's why I, I, I'm drawn to it. Yeah. it, it it's not easy to understand. No. No, I like that. It leads me to the thought that um, through all these years you must have been through quite a lot of interesting happenings. What is the most bizarre thing that ever occurred to you? Difficult question, I know. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I th I'm just thinking, you know, I think probably the, the most extraordinary and a really taste of what the 20th century is uh, was coming back from our wedding uh, into the riots in Los Angeles uh, in 92. Mm -hmm. That was quite the most extraordinary episode, coming from the tranquility of somewhere like Florence in Italy yeah. to complete and absolute social unrest within a 12-hour period and not really realizing that we were stepping back into that. That mm -hmm. was... Uh, I'll never forget that. Those, those few days you, were yeah, yeah, quite extraordinary. Yeah. And, and standing on the, the roof of our building and watching the smoke coming from all over the city, it was really quite a very strange thing. You know, somebody gave me a book today uh, called Century, and it's, um, it, it's a book of photographs from the last hundred years, 1899 to 1999. And it, it really, I was looking through it before I came here today, and it just struck me how incredibly villainous and murderous this century was. It's really, one hopes that the few glimmers of hope that you see throughout the book can be magnified for where mm -hmm. we're going now. It's so the do next you century. feel that there is any hope for the next century? Well, I, I personally have to feel it because I have family and I want my family, obviously, to be safe and to live a joyful and fulfilled life. So you have to think in a, in a positive way. Yeah. But it's not... Uh, it leaves one a bit despondent looking at the last hundred years in a way. And obviously with today's news about Chechnya, and yeah. it's... Uh, Don't we all have the hopes? Let's hope yeah, they will be fulfilled. Yeah, yeah. Mr. David Bowie, a pleasure to have you here. The oh, stage is yours. Thank you. Bro. Thank you very much. You. Mr. David Bowie! If you met the young David Bowie down at the ha. street, yeah. And you could uh, give him just very briefly a short advice about the life. What yeah. would you tell him? Don't shave your eyebrows off. <laughs> they take forever to grow back. It's oh. funny you should say that, actually, because I've just written an article for a magazine where uh, myself at 53 actually interviews uh, myself at 19. And uh, we approach a lot of interesting areas. It, it seems like it was... Uh, I did it as an experiment, but it actually was, uh, it actually got my, really got my uh, curiosity. I want to continue it because it's quite fun. It really is quite fun. It sets up some really interesting dialogue between the two. Yeah. Not, all, not all of it obviously answerable either. Some of it really sort of grey areas. It's quite strange. Your latest uh, record or album yes. sounds a little like uh, the music you did in, in the 70s. Is it a kind of musical circle for you? It does have some of that, doesn't it? Um, I suppose it was intended. Uh, 
the, the idea for doing the music originally came from a, a Paris company that started a video computer game called uh, Nomad Soul. And they asked me if I'd do a, a, a kind of a soundtrack for it. And I don't really, I'm not really into games very much. I don't know very much about them. But my son is a gamer and, and we explored it together. And uh, he came to the conclusion that it was probably one of the better games that he worked with and advised his father that he should do the music. So I did. But what I wanted to do with the music was have some sense of uh, time, um, a stretch of time. Um, and so one of the ways that I gave that feeling was to work in the style that I would have worked in 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and wrote very much in that fashion, which is very quietly, very kind of secluded, and uh, did a lot of the work before I went into the studio. So it was all pretty much prepared, I guess, what one would call crafted songs, songs that were properly crafted in an old-fashioned way. So it does get, have that, it has the resonance of kind of the early 70s. I think. Which kind of influence do you like it has on society and politics <laughs> and for the listener? It's nice, well, for me as a listener, uh, it's nice to hear certain bands and hear my inflections or, or certain chord structures or ways or techniques that I've sort of used in the past. Uh, it, it kind of is good for my vanity to feel that I've contributed to how the music is. Um, so I get a kick out of that. Um, and I like seeing bands that um, maybe have adopted some of the more theatrical ways of doing things. I like that too. <laughs> but that's fine. That's my kick. That's my that's what I, that's my prize for having worked hard. <laughs> but you, I don't know. You've had the opportunity to to influence on on the growing up of a whole generation. Oh. You don't think so? You don't feel like that? Oh no, I don't think uh, an influence along with so many others. Yeah. So it's, it becomes minimal in the end. You just become part of the spectrum of it all. You know. How would you describe the generation? What, my generation? Yeah, the people who... In their 50s. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how are they living? What are they like? I don't, well, the ones that I know, and I do know a lot, uh, but maybe it's because I've gravitated toward like-minded people in, in, as I've grown and developed stronger relationships and friendships. But they usually, a lot of them are active in the arts somewhere. Uh, I know quite a number of prose writers, painters, other musicians. Uh, even architects. Um, and it seems that the one thing that we all share is that we've been able to keep in touch with the enthusiasms or the sense of enthusiasm that we had when we were teenagers, that we still operate uh, with the kind of curiosity factor that we had back then. Um, the idea of the 50-year-old who goes out and tends his garden of roses and all that, I don't actually know anybody like that. Mm. And I'm not really uh, willing to believe that that, in my experience, that person doesn't exist. As much as I love roses. <laughs> but I prefer giving them than yeah. growing them. And you think that's nice, that they don't exist, so, ma so many of them, with the rose well, gardens? Well, I don't, I don't know whether I'd make a, a, a qualitative judgment on it. I'm sure it must be a lot of fun for some people who've had a hard and stern life to be able to retire from that and develop something that they feel uh, brings them to an essence of what life is really about, to be able to tend a garden. And in my way, uh, I, I, I would almost feel that I retired when I was a teenager. I mean, I retired from my only proper job into the career that I seem to have had over this last 30 years, longer, um, that of being a musician and an artist. It's never felt like a career in that way. It's felt that this is kind of... I in heaven, because I, I seem to be able to make my way through life doing the very things that I always thought were just fun, and, and I'm doing that. So in a way, I'm very lucky. But I understand the appeal of a, a, a garden, I suppose. In the, the lyrics on, on the latest album, you have some descriptions of the feeling of, of, uh, of longing and, and missing. Mm. But it's terribly sad album. Yeah. Actually. Why is it like that? Well, I wanted it to be. <laughs> I think uh, 
probably because I'm at heart a romantic, not terribly, uh, not terribly modern at all. I probably my my sensibility is probably much nearer to uh, uh, a late nineteenth century artist than it is to a twentieth century artist. Uh, I wanted I wanted the character on the album, if you can call him a character. But anyway, the genre of uh, uh, emotional content on the on the album to be. Uh, someone who's not fulfilled themselves, somebody who has had possibly an empty life, or a lonely life at, at least, um, and that opportunities have passed him by, and, and there's an awful lot of what if in, in this album. If only I'd done that, and if only I'd done this. Because um, there's nothing worse than listening to a happy album. <laughs> I couldn't write a happy album. I wouldn't have, I prefer to keep the happiness for my life. Is that selfish? But I do. Because you yourself, you have, you have rest and, and peace in your mind. I have a great life. Yeah. I have such an incredible life. I cannot believe that I've kind of gone through everything that I've gone through and come out at the other end so luckily content with uh, my life as it is. I enjoy the work that I do tremendously. I have terrific relationships with my family. I have a wonderful wife. And it's raining today, and I don't care. <laughs> you know, I enjoy getting up every morning. Life holds uh, just the most blessings, and every 24 hours, I love it. What am I dreaming about? Yeah, yeah. In terms of a future, uh, I don't really uh, exert much energy in that direction. It's not something that I wish to build up expectations about. I much prefer to come to, and it's not always something that works, but one tries to make the present the, the, uh, the, the hub and the pivot of one's life. I mean, if, if I'm not enjoying myself in the present, it doesn't really give me the uh, uh, courage to believe that my future will be any better. So I have to learn to enjoy what I have today. So as much as anything, it's quite a discipline to try and make that happen. So therefore, the more, the more energy you put into that, the less energy you do expend on, well, next year I'll do this and blah, blah, blah. that's rubbish. It's rubbish. It never works out like that. That's a problem the problem that... The best laid plans of mice and men after gang astray. That's a problem in the lyrics, what if, what if, if you're dreaming it of is, too much. It is, unfortunately, yes, yeah. yeah, somebody, because, I mean, I really feel, because I've done it myself, that every day can be a new start to one's life, you know. I don't change my life every day, but there have been points when I've woken up in my life and said, I'm changing things, you know? I'm not happy with things as they are. I wish them to change, so I will do it. Um, and I, I really believe that one can do that. So I, th I, I really, although I feel, for, I do feel uh, a strong sympathy and a compassion for people who have more than their uh, fair share of uh, regrets about their past, I also feel that they can change their lives if they want to. But that's uh, maybe asking too much. Obviously, you know, well, my circumstances are not like that. They're not like yours and blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm not sure that I'm prepared to completely go along with that. I read something that you, you said something that you always were busy and you're always busy going into your career and, yeah. and stop living because uh, you I had this feeling that you just have to, to hurry on. Absolutely. I believe that was so when I was young. I really didn't... Uh, one, I didn't appreciate the uh, joys and uh, the strengths of having a, a, a... of being a social animal, of having relationships. It seemed like that sort of rather icing on the cake to me at the time. It was like, well, I've got these things in my mind that I wanted to do. I was incredibly focused. But it was about the work. My entire young life was about the work. And I think I really didn't learn anything about how to have relationships until the 80s, uh, which is terribly sad. But all artists are born of dysfunctionalism, you know. Every artist I've ever met is quite bonkers, <laughs> completely mad. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only way you can survive as an artist. I think perhaps. that's why they want to be artists in the first place. Anybody who wants to express himself so forcefully by being a painter or a musician or something, most people are happy just to chat to the person next door and say, you know what I think, blah, blah, blah. But painters have to, you know, musicians, 
It's dysfunctionalism. Yeah. There's something wrong with this. But it's a good amusement for the rest of the world. <laughs> So, some years ago, you said that you uh, needed to find balance in yourself uh, as a person and, and musically before the year 2000. Yeah. So I think you found it now. I think I found it. I, it. It feels like that to me, you know. It's. Uh, it re and again, it's about it's. There's some hard work attached to it. It's like not allowing one's kind of interior life to take over and create a wall between people that you know and your loved ones. It's a question that keeps saying that this is work. Stop this and give time, you know, for this person and listen to what this person is talking about. You know, stuff like that. Elemental things that everybody else knows about <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but people like me have to learn it much later in life. But it's a lovely prize at the end anyway. What, what is the society like when we turn into the year 2000? God, what a big question. It's a big question, yeah. yeah. Um, it's an odd dichotomy. We have the, the many thousands of years of written history have not really implied that the human being is actually a satisfactory kind of animal. Um, there is so much that we mishandle, and there's really no proof that we get any better at anything. So. Only the clothes change. <laughs> <laughs> Only the outside. Only the outside yeah. changes. I think at heart, we are still this, uh, we still are this, this pathological, quandary-filled bag of messed up, disenfranchised spirits and emotions. But we dance a real good dance, don't we? I kind of felt that, um, immodestly, that I had made it, uh, some kind of uh, change in the way that music was approached. I knew that um, by the early 80s, I mean, before I did things like around Scary Monsters in that period, I knew that what I'd been doing had been taken on board by quite a few other artists and, and it was starting to replicate itself in different ways, you know. Bowie har alltid gillat att göra fiktion av livet och skippat de här traditionellt självbiografiska bitarna. Vare sig det nu är att skriva text om sina kompisar som han gör nu eller som förr när han plockade fram allt regon som vände på verkligheten. But so why did you do it? Is it like the, the need to pull out different aspects of yourself or so? Well it was actually, I mean when I was doing that uh, uh, sort of pretty much fundamentally as a character on stage it was just more interesting. It was just more <laughs> interesting. Yes. <laughs> You know, it really, I, 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 I was so excited, you know, but at the end of the 60s, having done, uh, having seen where, uh, where theatre and art and, and all these other facets of culture could be pulled into rock um, that hadn't really been done before. And the idea of taking a theatrical scenario on stage with a characterization rather than playing the, uh, the, honest Joe guy with full of integrity and this is my life and I'll pull my heart and blue jeans and all that. I thought, well, yeah, I don't really buy that. <laughs> There's something even synthetic about that. That's artificial. That has its own kind of artificiality. So why not go the entire way and create an entirely synthetic situation and see where would that, it, is that interesting? There were a bunch of us at that time, like obviously like Roxy to, and uh, some others to a certain extent. That I think we were, were aware um, that we had the, the 70s really was the start of a pluralistic society in, in, in a major way. It was the dawn of the so-called postmodern era, and that the idea of playing with our pasts and playing with absolutes and and doing a lot of what if and and rejuxtaposing things against each other seemed to be part of what the future was about, um, and we kind of felt it very strongly then. And I think about 1972, I think we all kind of looked at each other uh, metaphysically and said, you know what, this is the 21st century. This is how it's going to start, like this. I've heard or read that you said that you are what the greatest amount, or greatest number of people think that you are. Yes, I think so. And that you'd have no control over that. Absolutely so. none. Right. So if we turn that question around, have you yeah. yourself doubted yourself or seen yourself differently throughout the years? Introspectively speaking. Uh, 
Yes, I think probably I'm far less ambitious than I was when I was younger, but I think that's, I think that's the luggage of, I'm not sure if it's maturity, because I'm not sure where, how much maturity I had, but I think there's a, a realization that to have huge expectations of the future is probably fairly unhealthy, that it, that, that to one's psyche, and I think it's probably far uh, more rational and in the end, more fulfilling to concentrate on the, just the period that you're living through rather than anticipating, oh yes, and then I'll do this, and then I'll do that, and then, ah, forget about it. Just concentrate on now, today, this week, you know. That's quite enough ambition, really. So I think that one's been quite a drastic change in me. But it's taken, it's been, that's, it wasn't overnight by any means. But it might have started in the 80s, I think, when I really had to rebalance myself and decide what it was at the middle age point. So, is it true that you wanted to quit just in that year? I think probably, yeah, I, I guess there were, there were times when I really felt that uh, probably I'd really lost my way, that I really didn't know what I was doing anymore. And I was almost walking through music. And that was a very unsettling feeling, and I didn't like it. And I thought, I'd better quit because I'm not enjoying this at all. And uh, it just turned around on me, you know, and then things changed again. And uh, I started to look for what it was that I really enjoyed about music, and that meant getting very small again, and getting rid of that whole arena, stadium-y kind of thing that I'd seem to have found myself within, and, and doing the most ridiculous thing, which is try and put myself in a band. <laughs> Which for me worked, you see. I mean, this is, it, there's been so much debate about poor old Tim Machine, about whether they were good or bad. You know, I'm, that's almost not the point. The point was I actually needed to do that. To break it down. Yeah, yeah, it was very important to me. Your kind of, you know, sense of iron, your sense of self-mockery, wherever did that spring from? It's kind of a British thing. Um, to replace our sense of aloofness, I think that we tend to get kind of derisory about things and kind of joke about them, you know. And uh, I, I, but I always find it in the best work, I find there's a sense of humor, it doesn't matter how dark it gets. There's always a sense of, uh, I can't believe this is happening, it, this is so ridiculous. If you look at other new bands like Suede, for example, do you go like, oh my God, these guys have been listening to Diamond Dogs and Siggy or whatever, you know, your own influence? Yeah. Um, I have to say that I, I, I feel nothing. Uh, my vanity is is completely suckered by that, and and uh, I'm I'm really pleased. <laughs> I had I, I felt much the same way about people like Little Richard, you know, and, uh, and when I did meet them, I told him, you know, how much he meant to me, and how he really sort of, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be playing music, you know, and it. I don't think he really had any idea that, you know, I mean. I, I'm sure he didn't, because my music sounds nothing like Little Richard. But the fact is, he was the initial engine that got me started, you know. And, and, and receiving those things from other people, for me, is, is, is really great. It's fabulous, you know, and it's, uh, it's probably one of the nicest things that um, can happen to one as, as you kind of, you know, get older and you find you kind of settling in a different place in, in, in music or the art or whatever, you know. It's great. Yay! <laughs> If rock chameleon and legend David Bowie were to start all over again, he would face, amongst other countless projects, a re recording on no less than 23 solo albums. So maybe Mr. Bowie should have a rethink. I've had a ball. <laughs> I've had such a great life, haven't I? What a lucky, jammy I am. So it's back to late 1999 and David Bowie has released his latest work, an album entitled Hours, a collection of songs which is being referred to as one of his most autobiographical to date. But if only he could remember those early days. I, I certainly can see that uh, a lot of the incidents where I refer to the younger self uh, are definitely in the, the scope of my memory. My, my, my memory is traditionally not the uh, most certain thing as well. Uh, could be somebody else's memories, I'm not sure, you know. I really didn't want to refer to anything current um, for the hours. I, I wanted it to have a sensibility of the past. I wanted it to reflect work that I've done before, because then it gives substance to the idea of it having an autobiographical feel, but I didn't want it to become retro. 
far from retro but still very Bowie is the first release of the Hours album, First Day's Child. <coughs> the song was to uh, represent the idea of um, one man's disillusionment with his present situation, or rather the fact that he settled into a kind of resigned state uh, with a wife who is probably somebody he loves but is not in love with, and uh, a lifestyle which will do. Um, and he looks back to his earlier self and kind of just thinking, what if, what if I'd made things very different? What if I'd stayed with that girl as, and instead of breaking up? What if this, what if that? I explained that to Walter Stern, who's the director, and, and I must say, Walter, I've always admired Walter's work, because he has these, he can take these very normal, mundane situations and just give them a shift and a kind of a disquieting movement to them that, that takes them out of the normal. Will, I think, uh, be one of the favourite videos that I've made. I think it's an exceptional piece of work. And with a legacy of masterpieces behind him, David Bowie still lives by a simple theory of creative survival. I think it's a question of, of keeping uh, in touch with uh, uh, the society that you live in and, and not losing the uh, original enthusiasm for what makes you tick and what, what really sort of tweaks your interest.